Hello and welcome to the second video in the series of HL7 messaging tutorials where we focus on understanding the HL7 message structure. Let's start with our sample HL7 message from the previous tutorial. I can make out a bit of information here. I can see a couple of names and a country, but I don't really see the context of these. To explain what's going on, let's start by simplifying this message right down to its most basic element. That's better. Now assume that this is our HL7 message. Well, all the messages are divided up into segments of related information. These are always separated by carriage returns, so each of these segments are simply a separate line of the message. The first segment in every HL7 message is always the message header. This segment conveys the metadata of the message, like who sent it and when. The message header is indicated in the first three letters of the segment as MSH. In fact, every segment has its own three letter header that identifies what the segment is about. Some common ones include PID or PID that provides the patient information. NK1 is a repeatable segment that lists the patient's next of kin. PV1 provides details of the patient's visit, such as doctors and dates. SEH is for updating appointments into the hospital schedule. And OBRs, these provide details of a group of observation results. As we delve deeper into the HL7 message structure, we find that segments are themselves divided up into fields. These are normally separated by a pipe character between each of the fields. Fields each have an assigned value type that relates to its position in the segment. So in this greatly simplified example PID segment, we might find the patient name is at PID 1, the date of birth at PID 2, and details about where they live at PID 3. So now let's take a look at our actual HL7 message to put what we've learned so far into context. This is our HL7 message loaded into a Zoom section of HL7 soup. Notice how the pipes are highlighted in blue to help you see the field divisions. So let's look at how our simplified examples fields show in the actual HL7 message. Here we see the PID header, and like all of the segment headers, it is emphasized with a bold blue, making it much easier to distinguish between the segment headers and wrapped lines that were longer than would fit into the screen without following onto the next line. As for the fields, we can see that the real segment holds a lot more data than our simplified sample. But just so that you can spot them, here's the patient's name, their date of birth, and their address details. Now it's pretty clear that colourful syntax alone does not make locating where a field should be any easier. So let's zoom out to the full HL7 soup window and see what features can help you work with HL7 fields. Let's start by looking at our segment header. You've seen it shown in the HL7 message editor, but it is also shown in different ways elsewhere in the application. Here it is shown in the interpretation panel, which we learnt from the last tutorial gives us a human readable summary of the message. And here we see it with its official segment name above the segment grid. We also get similar views of the fields. If we look for the patient's name field, we will find it in the interpretation panel, and also in the message editor, and in the segments grid. One of the most helpful features here is that all of these locations are linked together so that when I click in the patient's first name you can see that the first name is highlighted in the HL7 message editor. With its own tooltip that tells you the path to the field PID 5.2 as well as the field's description. And over in the segments grid we can see another representation of the patient's name with each of its components broken up for easier editing and with the given name highlighted in green as that was the given name component of the patient's name that I clicked on. Let's now take a closer look at the HL7 patient name in a bit more detail. It's pretty easy to spot Sam Brown's name, but what are all those green carrots? 
You may have already guessed, they are field separators. They delimit the patient's name into family name, given name, and in this sample message, a value that specifies the type of name. In this instance, it's the patient's birth name. But what about all those other carrots between Sam and B? Something's missing. That's because the segment grid is only showing fields which have values. But if I click on the Show Empty button, I see the grid expand to show fields that don't have any values assigned. So now I see those carrots hold space for the patient's middle name their suffix, their prefix, and their degree. Let's go back to our diagram now so we can continue looking at what divides up the fields. We've seen how fields can be broken into components and how we use the caret to delimit the items in these fields. But we can also go a step further as some components can also be divided up into subcomponents. For instance, the surname can be divided into two, creating a surname and a surname prefix subcomponent. And these we delimit by the ampersand character. Notice how we now have two items representing the patient's surname. You'll need to be wary of this if you're doing integration work, as addressing these can be a little fiddly. A common workaround is to address the lowest possible address for the value that you're after. So for example, in the actual HL7 message, you would address the patient's first name as PID 5.2, as there are no subcomponents for first name. But you would address the surname as PID 5.1.1, to avoid any confusion between the two possible locations for the surname value. Another feature of HL7 messaging is that it allows some fields and components to be repeatable. For instance, you might have two addresses, one for your home and one for your place of work. Well, this can be done by repeating the field with the tilde character between each of the values. I suggest you quickly load up HL7 soup now and go through some of the sample messages to help familiarize the concepts that we've just covered. Take a closer look at how the location paths, such as the PID 5.1, identify where to find values, and notice how that these are consistent across all the HL7 messages. Remember, you can download a free 30-day trial of HL7 Soup from www.hl7soup.com that will help you through this tutorial series. In the next session, we'll take a closer look at the HL7 event types of MSH9.